good day, my friends. It's your old pal Jordan the Lion, your old pal Jaw, coming back from Natchitoches, Louisiana. Beautiful area. I hope to come back in the future. I want to come back for the Christmas time when they do all their lights and everything. But we're going to leave today, and I wasn't originally going to do this vlog on this trip, but yesterday I went out and kind of visited the site, and it just stirred up so, so many emotions in me that I just felt compelled to do it today. So today we're going to go visit the unfortunate crash site of Jim Croce, a man who, beautiful singer-songwriter, a guy who wrote about what he lived, his time as a trucker, his time in construction, a guy who was just three short years into his career and at the age of 30 years old, made an accident. Actually, it's, it's more than an accident. It's just such an unfortunate happening. His life was ended at the airport here in town. So we're gonna go out and visit the site and they have a nice big plaque out there that commemorates Jim and hope if you're a fan of Time in the Bottle or Bad Bad Leroy Brown that you'll like this vlog. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. So sadly what brought Jim out here was a performance. He was performing at Northwestern State University and was on his way to catch a flight to perform in Austin the next day. We gotta stretch out his legs before we go. I mean, really, what is better than a roadside gorilla? Unless you have two. Even in the sad vlogs, I have to point out the roadside attractions. And our special Patreon sunglass vlog today is for Thrifter Junker Vintage Hunter. Hope you enjoy what we do today. So we're coming a little bit of a different way from Northwestern. So once we go through this intersection, we'll be on the same route that he was taking that day. See, he would have been coming from the left over here, making a left onto the road in front of us. Northwestern's literally right there. I can see the school from here from this intersection. Can you imagine? Austin probably wasn't even a six hour drive from here. And you're taking, you think you're taking a short hour plus flight. So we're going to be turning on to this little dirt road right here. So here's the start of the airfield. I guess it's not a dirt road, it's just a really bad asphalt, old asphalt road. There's the tiny little airport right here. So here's the airport. I think one of the reasons this was so sobering for me was when I walked in, I was just kind of like stupefied by how small it was. And just to think, you know, it's very possible they would have just driven maybe Jim and his entourage that were traveling with him right out to the plane on the, the runway. But more than likely, they would have been dropped off here and would have been inside this building during it. One of the things I thought was really fascinating about Jim Croce was that for being, I guess you would consider him kind of like a folk rock kind of guy or like a working man's folk rock. One of the things that I always thought that was interesting was he wasn't really influenced by folk. He was, if you listen to his playing, he was really influenced by like Dixieland and ragtime and country. So his sound was much different. He had such a great voice. He just sadly died at 30 years old and what was interesting also to me was his career you know his parents weren't necessarily very supportive of wanting him to be a musician so his wife is also a guitar player and they played together sometimes but when they got married his parents gave him $500 and a stipulation that was part of the wedding gift was the $500 stipulation saying that he had to use the money to record an album 
because their hope was that if he recorded the album, it wouldn't be successful and he would get it out of his system, but he ended up recording it and it was successful. He had the start of a career and then was having hits. He was at the top of the charts when he passed away here. Here's the little waiting room area, and right here when you walk in, if you don't know the story, it's a sad one to me. So it says on here, songwriter James Joseph Jim Croce was born in South Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1943. Jim's ability to write a humorous song about everyday people and experiences like Rapid Roy the Stock Car Boy and Roller Derby Queen as well as ballads like Time in a Bottle and I'll Have to Say I Love You in a Song have kept Jim Croce a major influence in American roots music. Jim was enjoying hard-fought success as a singer-songwriter in 1973 when he was tragically killed in a plane crash at the age of 30. On September 20th, Croce had just completed a concert at Northwestern State University and was flying to another performance in Austin, Texas. Upon takeoff, at Nakatish Regional Airport, the Beechcraft E-18 plane failed to gain enough altitude to clear a pecan tree at the end of the runway. The pilot and all passengers were killed instantly. Those included Croce's close friend and one-man band, Maury Mulehuizen, his road manager, Dennis Rast, comic George Stevens, Croce's booking agent, Kenneth D. Cortese, and pilot Robert Newton Elliott. Jim Croce scored his first number one hit with Bad Bad Leroy Brown. In the three years leading up to the accident, Jim Croce wrote and recorded seven Billboard Top Ten singles, two of which reached the number spot. Since his death, Croce has sold a million records a year and is one of only a handful of artists in history to hold the number one and number two album spot on Billboard Top 100 charts. He was inducted into the Songwriter Hall of Fame in 1989 and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2009. Jim's wife, Ingrid, pays tribute to Jim with Croce's Restaurant and Jazz Bar in downtown San Diego, where they established their home. So here's Maury Muehlheisen, who is Jim's one-man band. And Maury, actually, what's interesting is when they first started performing together, Maury was the singer and Jim was his lead guitar player, and then as they were performing together, they ended up switching, and Jim became the singer, and Maury became the lead guitar player. So here's the runway where they would have taken off from, and they would have been going that direction. And what I never understood was, you know, the story was always that they, they never made full takeoff and didn't clear a pecan tree, and that's what caused the accident, but they never really mentioned that the flight report said that the pilot um, ended up having a heart attack and that that's what happened, that he had had a heart attack, which made me think, you know, you never, you never think when you take a small plane like this, hey, what if something happens to the pilot in this one hour ride? So very sobering to see this for me. Can you imagine? I mean, at takeoff, he suffers a heart attack and the plane would have crashed right out in there. And there's the little airport. Boy, if this doesn't help you remember to appreciate every day, I don't know what would. Oh, look, we have a plane getting ready to take off right now, as a matter of fact. What's sad is also that I have a friend named Joanna Cassidy who used to live here in town and when I reminded her that Jim passed away taking off here, she gasped and said, oh my gosh, I have flown out of there so many times, I didn't even, I didn't even realize it. Speaking of Joanna Cassidy, let's go see Joanna Cassidy's house. 
she used to live here for 12 years and she wanted to make sure that what's funny is that she said make sure you go by my house and then when she told me where it was I go you were two doors down from the steel magnolias house wow hello steel magnolias house again Eatonton house so this beautiful historic house here was Joanna's house Joanna Cassidy known as I'm right on top of that rose from Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead and Blade Runner. I love it. Those blue shutters, it's so cool. All these houses in town have some significance or named after a historic family that lived here. Look at the gate, it's even got the, I mean, you see these all over Louisiana. Very cool. This one's called the Laureate House, if you're looking for it. We were also really close to the gates of Northwestern by Joanna, so I wanted to show that since that's where Jim performed. Right, we are finally off the freeway. Actually, not finally, we were only on there for like 40 miles, but happy to be on the back roads. We were passing through Mansfield and I saw that there's a Civil War battlefield here, so I just wanted to stop by and take a look. Kind of interested. Here they have a couple of markers. This one over here says, on April 8th, 1864, Major General Richard Taylor rode in front of the Louisiana Brigade of Brigadier General Alfred Mouton's division to prepare them for the impending battle Taylor would later write that he had told them. As they were fighting in defense of their own soil, I wished the Louisiana troops to draw the first blood. It says Louisiana troops would both draw and shed the first blood as they would make a gallant charge to halt the Union advance a few hours later. Several hundred Louisiana troops lay dead or wounded on this hallowed ground including the following field officers killed in action. Brigadier General Alfred Mouton, Colonel James Beard, Colonel Leopold Armand, Lieutenant Colonel James Walker, Lieutenant Colonel Franklin H. Clack. Sorry. And they have some of the cannons over here. Well, field guns, I guess they're called. It says six pound field guns. It's sad that you have to fight for your own soil. And they even have a little museum here on the grounds. Here they have some of Colonel Beard's clothing that we read about. His boots. Colonel James Beard. There's his hat. Look at the boots with like the spurs on there. Baby shoes belonging to his daughter. Brass powder flask, his field case, his sword belt, and that was Colonel James Beard. This was the headquarters designation flag. There was originally a, uh, a church on the grounds and they had to convert it to a hospital. And that's what this is showing. being operated on and the sad realities of war amputated parts down here very powerful this is a Bible that was bought here in Mansfield the day after one of the soldiers bought it the day after the battle having survived he was so thankful there's one of the battle Colt army guns. And then a rifle, musket. And over here 
here. They have some more guns from the battle. With the bayonets down there. And here's a quilt from 1850. And these are, looks like Confederate swords. But what's interesting is that a lot of the belts have like an identification on them. Like that one's from the state of New York. Volunteer main militia. I think it was a way of identifying soldiers. Confederate square. And look at this little pocket revolver. These things are tiny. Now here it's talking about Prince Camille de Polignac was in command of the Texas Infantry Brigade at Mansfield. Brigadier General Camille de Polignac led his troops in the initial Confederate charge against the Union, positioned just north of the visitor center. Suffering heavy losses while brave soldiers, suffering heavy losses while braving showers of musketry and artillery fire, Polignac's troops played a key role in the defeat of the Union line. And they have his suit that he wore when he was presented to Queen Victoria. Here's a uniform from the 165th New York Infantry Regiment. That is a blood-stained officer sash. See the blood stains, that dark, that kind of black. And these were all actual medical instruments that were used in the hospital here to care for the soldiers and the wounded after the battle in the aftermath. Medical saddlebags. So those were used for drilling in. Bayonets used as hooks to bury the dead. And then this was one of the doctors. And that American flag is from the 165th New York Regiment as well that we saw that uniform from. And this is the Trans-Mississippi, or the Dick Taylor Confederate battle flag. And this is kind of one of the coolest things for last. A matching set, a rare Confederate jacket and trousers. Very thin, compared to people nowadays, anyway. Well, I think that's going to do it for us here at the Mansfield Battlefield. That was a really interesting sight. I just, I saw the signs. I couldn't pass it up. I, my curiosity got the better of me. And I'm really glad that we stopped and saw all that stuff. Rest in peace to those who lost their lives on this field. So this is interesting. It's dedicated to the Lafayette of the South, Prince de Polignac. But it says at the bottom, here is where General Moulton fell. Here, Prince de Polignac sprang to the head of the troops to take the fallen leader's place and bear them to victory. Named the Lafayette of the South. Oh, look up on that building. That is so cool. Hello, Texas again. There's our welcome sign. I just entered the town of Tenaha, and I saw this. I said, you know, we gotta stop and take a look at this. Very cool. You got Tex Ritter over here, John Ritter's dad. Timson, Bobo, and Blair. The garden spot of East Texas. If you look up here, you can see exactly where we are. Louisiana is over here, and we just made our way over to here. So I just saw a sign that said the town of Rusk 
is coming up in like 40 miles. There's a story to the state hospital there that I'm going to go and show you. I didn't realize we were out this way, but it's something I was kind of intrigued by seeing for quite a while when I saw we were here. We're going to go by and add it to this. So this is Rusk State Hospital. There was a musician that I was a big fan of named Rocky Erickson. He was really got his name started in the 60s playing in a psychedelic band called the 13th Floor Elevators. They were kind of credited as being one of the first psychedelic punk bands. Their big hit was You're Gonna Miss Me. They even had a jug band or like a jug performer in the band. And when they were out touring at one point, he would start speaking in tongues and people thought they were seeing the the beginning of schizophrenia and then they got arrested the band got pulled over with marijuana back in a time in Texas where it was a major major offense and so they ended up um, pleading insanity instead of sending him to prison and he got locked away here at Rusk for years and they did electrotherapy basically electroshock therapy he went from being a burgeoning musician to sitting in a chair in a hallway all day with a legal pad writing songs, hunched over. It was a really, really sad life. And it wasn't until people that found his music started inquiring about what happened to him and started calling him and finding out that he wasn't as bad as, or at least he was getting worse in there. They thought he was mismedicated and that it was actually killing him or it was ruining his life so they ended up helping to get him out and he lived a pretty crazy life for the rest of his life he had to be taken care of by family and eventually was medicated properly and started performing again and I got to see him before he passed away great Rocky Erickson sad sad time in his life though that's for sure there's a really good documentary about Rocky's life while Rocky was still alive. It was called You're Gonna Miss Me. And you would see later on in life when he was living alone, he would turn on like the TV on static. He would have the radio on. He would have a keyboard playing like a drum track. He would have like six different things on to confuse his mind so that he was able to calm down enough to go to sleep. He would have, that's what he would do to try and block out the voices in his head. That's, that's a pretty sad existence. A lot of people claim that it was because of the electroshock in there that really got him to that point. Well, my friends, we're going to call it a day. Thank you all for watching. I know we had some sad moments in here, but I hope they weren't all bad. Hope you enjoyed this vlog and we'll see you next time. Thank you all for watching and goodbye.